Court Johns, NDP, the writing of Courtney Alberti. It's just constant. I'm afraid to check my phone because I'm worried. I'm going to get another message about somebody else who's died. John Barlow, Member of Parliament for Foothills, Southern Alberta, Conservative Party. It happens to real people. It happens to normal people. And it happens to people that you would never expect it to happen to. We lost four people in one week, and we knew them by names. My name is Ariel Kaibaga. I'm the Liberal Member of Parliament for London West. I'm Jenny Kwan. I'm the Member of Parliament for Vancouver East for the NDP. With what other health condition would you think is normal to know that people are dying to the degree that they are today, that you think we, we're not going to do everything we can to, to stop that from happening? I'm Todd Doherty. I'm the Conservative Member of Parliament for Carrie Woodburn Church. We have to do something. I, I, I don't have all the answers. I just know that something has to be done. I was in Vancouver at the airport and I took a phone call and, and I found out about two young boys, 17 years old, that had died together from toxic poison drugs. And, and I knew one of the boys. He was in and out of the child welfare system. He was a, a friend of my son's. I you know, watched this young boy grow up and you know, he didn't have a fighting chance. And just the, just the feeling, the overwhelming sense of pain from his loss. Um, and. Uh, I think part of it was guilt, like the, the colossal failure of all of us to tackle this crisis, to, to respond to it, and, and to prevent people like him from dying. Like it was, it was probably one of the toughest times. I uh, have a brother that's currently on the streets, uh, has been on the streets for going back to the 90s now. Uh, gripped in this uh, this epidemic, my brother <clears throat> you know here's a guy that um, a kid that was the youngest out of a family that um, you know uh, where dysfunction and abuse kind of perpetuated our daily lives. I've gone into uh, drug houses. I've gone and I paid this debt off with bikers and uh, the drug dealers. We pulled them off of a bridge uh, in the middle of the night. Um, you know, we brought them into our home, scoured the streets in many cities in, uh, in our province, trying to find him to make sure he was alive. You know, um, it's something else to uh, look in dumpsters for your, you know, for a loved one's body. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's something else. Patty Haidu, Member of Parliament, Thunder Bay Superior North, Liberal Cabinet Minister. Prior to this work, I ran a large homeless shelter in Northern Ontario. I have witnessed people who have died of overdose. I mean, it's probably one of the most traumatic work experiences of my life, attending the shelter late at night where a young man lost his life. But I'll never forget the call to his mother. And you know, they were not close. This mom asked me for help finding clothes to bury her child. They were living in a really desperately poor situation with no financial resources. Um, and she was devastated that she had lost her son and she deserved all the respect in the world. For my wife and I, we went through this with our, our oldest daughter. And for us, it was, it was like a bolt of lightning. We had kind of lost track of her for, for a few weeks. Um, you know, obviously as parents, you're, you're phoning, you're, you're texting, you're Facebook messenger, whatever you can do to kind of keep in touch. And uh, finally, um, I drove up to Calgary, uh, went to her apartment and just pounded on the door for what seemed like half an hour uh, until she finally answered. And I will never forget um, opening, her, opening the door and seeing her there. She didn't look, didn't look my, my kid didn't look like my daughter. Uh, it was the scariest moment in my life. Um, now, thankfully, uh, I'm extremely proud of her and how she has recovered 
and is doing so well eight years later. Um, but at that moment, I thought I'd lost my daughter. Uh, I really assumed that I would take her to the hospital and they would immediately put her in a treatment program. But for the doctor to come out basically and say, yeah, she's overdosed on fentanyl, um, she's good to go, you take her home. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I remember in the early days, I participated in a rally in the community where in a local park, the Oppenheimer Park in Vancouver's uh, downtown east side, um, and the community pegged it as the killing fields. And in those days, they actually planted a thousand crosses. Each cross had a name on it. It was uh, somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's son, somebody's aunt, somebody's uncle whose lives have been lost. And at that time, what were we fighting for? We were fighting for the government to recognize harm reduction, to uh, bring in a supervised injection facility. Nobody wants their loved ones to have an addiction. A friend of mine who I went to high school with um, recently passed um, earlier this year. And, um, but he, he had actually been uh, well for, for a number of months. He was starting his life. He uh, got an apartment in one of our wraparound services. I remember helping his family get on the list. And um, it was the first day actually, that the first week that he got into his apartment. Uh, he must have lived there on Monday. From Monday to Wednesday, on Wednesday, he was found dead. <sighs> what I learned from it is that it is a very, um, aggressive disease. If you say this is urgent, where's the plan? Where's the plan with a timeline and resources? They spent less than 1% responding to this crisis than they did on COVID-19. Why? Because of the stigma. Make it easier for these, these people to get into recovery. It's frustrating. You know, as I said about my brother, I mean, uh, he was saying all the right stuff. You know, if only there was a bed. I remember the conversation with the social worker. There's nothing available for him. Uh, so the only course of action was to release him back into the, uh, the shelter, or back onto the streets. We have to give people a chance. We have to fight for him. I used to say at the shelter, when people come to the door looking for safe supplies, clean needles, you know, uh, pipes that are clean, etc., what they're saying is, I still have hope I could get better. And if I get better, I don't want to have HIV or hepatitis C. That's a health-seeking behavior. And so if we reframe that as about, in, in the sense that that's a hopefulness that people have, we have to continue to be brave and bold and trying new things. Dead people don't detox. So you can say as much as you want to say that recovery is the only option for you. And when you know that for a lot of people, that is not the option, at least not at that stage. It may be down the road, but you need to keep them alive. What I experienced with, with my daughter, and there was no treatment program for her to get into that right away. Um, we had to wait you know, weeks. I feel we're just perpetuating an ongoing crisis and hoping that it, re it resolves itself, right? If we just put a lot of money out there and, and put the safe supply out there, this, this will somehow solve itself. It's clearly not working. Clearly something else has to be done. What that, what that solution is, I don't think there is a definitive answer, but gosh darn it, we have to start putting some effort into this. Uh, this cannot carry on the way it is.